Sir Arthur Charles Clarke, the 16th of December 1917 to the 19th of March 2008, was a British science fiction writer, science writer and futurist, inventor, undersea explorer and television series host. He is famous for being co-writer of the screenplay for the 1968 film 2001: A Space Odyssey, widely considered to be one of the most influential films of all time. Clark was a science writer, who was both an avid popularizer of space travel and a futurist of uncanny ability. On these subjects he wrote over a dozen books and many essays, which appeared in various popular magazines. In 1961 he was awarded the Kalinga Prize, an award which is given by UNESCO for popularizing science. These along with his science fiction writings eventually earned him the moniker. Prophet of the Space Age. His other science fiction writings earned him a number of Hugo and Nebula awards, which along with a large readership made him one of the towering figures of science fiction. For many years Clark, Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov were known as the Big Three of science fiction. Clark was a lifelong proponent of space travel. In 1934, while still a teenager, he joined the British Interplanetary Society. In 1945, he proposed a satellite communication system using geostationary orbits. He was the chairman of the British Interplanetary Society from 1946-47 and again in 1951-53. Clark emigrated from England to Sri Lanka, formerly Ceylon, in 1956, largely to pursue his interest in scuba diving. That year he discovered the underwater ruins of the ancient Kineswaram Temple in Trincomalee. Clark augmented his fame later on in the 1980s, from being the host of several television shows such as Arthur C. Clark's Mysterious World. He lived in Sri Lanka until his death. Clark was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire CBE in 1989 for services to British cultural interests in Sri Lanka. He was knighted in 1998 and was awarded Sri Lanka's highest civil honour, Sri Lankabhimanya, in 2005. Biography Early years Clark was born in Minehead, Somerset, England, and grew up in nearby Bishop's Lydard. As a boy, he lived on a farm, where he enjoyed stargazing, fossil collecting, and reading American science fiction pulp magazines. He received his secondary education at Hewish Grammar School in Taunton. Early influences included dinosaur cigarette cards, which led to an enthusiasm for fossils starting about 1925. Clark attributed his interest in science fiction to reading three items, the November 1928 issue of Amazing Stories in 1929, Last and First Men by Olaf Stapledon in 1930, and The Conquest of Space by David Lasser in 1931. In his teens, he joined the Junior Astronomical Association and contributed to Urania, the Society's journal, which was edited in Glasgow by Marion Eddy. At Clark's request, she added an astronautics section, which featured a series of articles by him on spacecraft and space travel. Clark also contributed pieces to the Debates and Discussions Corner, a counterblast to an Urania article offering the case against space travel, and also his recollections of the Walt Disney film Fantasia. He moved to London in 1936 and joined the Board of Education as a pensions auditor. He and some fellow science fiction writers shared a flat in Gray's Inn Road, where he got the nickname, Ego, because of his absorption in subjects that interested him, and would later name his office filled with memorabilia as his, Ego Chamber. Topic. Second World War 
During the Second World War from 1941 to 1946 he served in the Royal Air Force as a radar specialist and was involved in the early warning radar defence system, which contributed to the RAF's success during the Battle of Britain. Clark spent most of his wartime service working on Ground Controlled Approach GCA radar, as documented in the semi-autobiographical Glide Path, his only non-science fiction novel. Although GCA did not see much practical use during the war, it proved vital to the Berlin Airlift of 1948–1949 after several years of development. Clark initially served in the ranks, and was a corporal instructor on radar at No. 2 Radio School, RAF Yatesbury in Wiltshire. He was commissioned as a pilot officer, technical branch, on 27 May 1943. He was promoted flying officer on 27 November 1943. He was appointed chief training instructor at RAF Honolulu in Warwickshire and was demobilized with the rank of flight lieutenant. Topic: <laughs> Post-war. After the war, he attained a first-class degree in mathematics and physics from King's College London. After this, he worked as assistant editor at Physics Abstracts. Clark then served as president of the British Interplanetary Society from 1946 to 1947 and again from 1951 to 1953. Although he was not the originator of the concept of geostationary satellites, one of his most important contributions in this field may be his idea that they would be ideal telecommunications relays. He advanced this idea in a paper privately circulated among the core technical members of the British Interplanetary Society in 1945. The concept was published in Wireless World in October of that year. Clark also wrote a number of non-fiction books describing the technical details and societal implications of rocketry and space flight. The most notable of these may be Interplanetary Flight, An Introduction to Astronautics 1950, The Exploration of Space 1951, and The Promise of Space 1968. In recognition of these contributions, the geostationary orbit 36,000 kilometers (22,000 miles) above the equator is officially recognized by the International Astronomical Union as the Clark Orbit. Following the 1968 release of 2001, Clark became much in demand as a commentator on science and technology, especially at the time of the Apollo space program. On 20 July 1969 Clark appeared as a commentator for CBS for the Apollo 11 moon landing. <laughs> Sri Lanka and diving Clark lived in Sri Lanka from 1956 until his death in 2008, first in Unawatuna on the south coast, and then in Colombo. Initially, he and his friend Mike Wilson traveled around Sri Lanka, diving in the coral waters around the coast with the Beachcombers Club. In 1957, during a dive trip off Trincomalee, Clark discovered the underwater ruins of a temple which would subsequently make the region popular with divers. He subsequently described it in his 1957 book The Reefs of Taprabane. This was his second diving book after the 1956 The Coast of Coral. Though Clark lived mostly in Colombo, he set up a small diving school and a simple dive shop near Trincomalee. He dived often at Hikadua, Trincomalee and Nilaveli. The Sri Lankan government offered Clark resident guest status in 1975. He was held in such high esteem that when fellow science fiction writer Robert A. Heinlein came to visit, the Sri Lanka Air Force provided a helicopter to take them around the country. In the early 1970s, Clark signed a three-book publishing deal, a record for a science fiction writer at the time. 
The first of the three was Rendezvous with Rama in 1973, which won all the main genre awards and spawned sequels that along with the 2001 series formed the backbone of his later career. In 1986 Clark was named a Grand Master by the Science Fiction Writers of America, in 1988 he was diagnosed with post-polio syndrome, having originally contracted polio in 1962, and needed to use a wheelchair most of the time thereafter. Clark was for many years a vice patron of the British Polio Fellowship. In the 1989 Queen's Birthday Honours, Clark was appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire, CBE, for services to British cultural interests in Sri Lanka. The same year he became the first Chancellor of the International Space University, serving from 1989 to 2004. He also served as Chancellor of Moratuwa University in Sri Lanka from 1979 to 2002. In 1994, Clark appeared in a science fiction film, he portrayed himself in the telefilm Without Warning, an American production about an apocalyptic alien first contact scenario presented in the form of a faux newscast. Clark also became active in promoting the protection of gorillas and became a patron of the gorilla organization which fights for the preservation of gorillas. When tantalum mining for cell phone manufacture threatened the gorillas in 2001, he lent his voice to their cause. The dive shop that he set up continues to operate from Trincomalee through the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. Topic. Television series host In the 1980s Clark became well known to many for his television programs Arthur C. Clark's Mysterious World, Arthur C. Clark's World of Strange Powers and Arthur C. Clark's Mysterious Universe. Topic. Personal life On a trip to Florida in 1953 Clark met and quickly married Marilyn Mayfield, a 22-year-old American divorcee with a young son. They separated permanently after six months, although the divorce was not finalized until 1964. The marriage was incompatible from the beginning, said Clark. Clark never remarried, but was close to a Sri Lankan man, Leslie Ekanayaki, the 13th of July 1947 to the 4th of July 1977, whom Clark called his only perfect friend of a lifetime. In the dedication to his novel The Fountains of Paradise, Clark is buried with Ekanayaki, who predeceased him by 3 decades in Colombo's Central Cemetery. In his biography of Stanley Kubrick, John Baxter cites Clark's homosexuality as a reason why he relocated, due to more tolerant laws with regard to homosexuality in Sri Lanka. Journalists who inquired of Clark whether he was gay were told, No, merely mildly cheerful. However, Michael Moorcock wrote, Everyone knew he was gay. In the 1950s I'd go out drinking with his boyfriend. We met his protégés, Western and Eastern, and their families, people who had only the most generous praise for his kindness. Self-absorbed he might be and a teetotaler, but an impeccable gent through and through. In an interview in the July 1986 issue of Playboy magazine, when asked if he had had a bisexual experience, Clark stated, Of course. Who hasn't? In his obituary, Clark's friend Carrie O'Quinn wrote, Yes, Arthur was gay. As Isaac Asimov once told me, I think he simply found he preferred men. Arthur didn't publicize his sexuality. That wasn't the focus of his life. But if asked, he was open and honest. Clark accumulated a vast collection of manuscripts and personal memoirs, maintained by his brother Fred Clark in Taunton, Somerset, England, and referred to as the Clark Ives. Clark said that some of his private diaries will not be published until 30 years after his death. 
When asked why they were sealed, he answered, well, there might be all sorts of embarrassing things in them. Topic. Knighthood On 26 May 2000 he was made a Knight Bachelor for services to literature at a ceremony in Colombo. The award of a knighthood had been announced in the 1998 New Year Honours list, but investiture with the award had been delayed, at Clark's request, because of an accusation, by the British tabloid The Sunday Mirror, of pedophilia. The charge was subsequently found to be baseless by the Sri Lankan police. According to the Daily Telegraph London, the Mirror subsequently published an apology, and Clark chose not to sue for defamation. Clark himself said that, I take an extremely dim view of people mucking about with boys, and Rupert Murdoch promised him the reporters responsible would never work in Fleet Street again. Clark was then duly knighted. Topic: Later years. Although he and his home were unharmed by the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake tsunami, his Arthur C. Clark Diving School, also called Underwater Safaris, at Hikaduwa near Gale, was destroyed. He made humanitarian appeals, and the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation worked towards better disaster notification systems. The school has since been rebuilt, because of his post-polio deficits, which limited his ability to travel and gave him halting speech. Most of Clarke's communications in his last years were in the form of recorded addresses. In July 2007, he provided a video address for the Robert A. Heinlein Centennial in which he closed his comments with a goodbye to his fans. In September 2007, he provided a video greeting for NASA's Cassini probe's flyby of Iapetus which plays an important role in the Book of 2001, A Space Odyssey. In December 2007 on his 90th birthday, Clark recorded a video message to his friends and fans bidding them goodbye. Clark died in Sri Lanka on the 19th of March 2008 after suffering from respiratory failure, according to Rohan De Silva, one of his aides. His aide described the cause as respiratory complications and heart failure stemming from post polio syndrome. Just hours before Clark's death, a massive gamma ray burst GRB, reached Earth. Known as GRB 080319b, the burst set a new record as the farthest object that could be seen from Earth with the naked eye. It occurred about 7.5 billion years ago, roughly equal to half the time since the Big Bang, taking the light that long to reach Earth. It was suggested by Larry Sessions, a science writer for Sky and Telescope magazine blogging on EarthSky.org, that the burst be named the Clark Event. American Atheist magazine wrote of the idea. It would be a fitting tribute to a man who contributed so much, and helped lift our eyes and our minds to a cosmos once thought to be province only of gods. A few days before he died, he had reviewed the manuscript of his final work, The Last Theorem, on which he had collaborated by email with his contemporary Frederick Pohl. The book was published after Clark's death. Clark was buried alongside Leslie Ekinayaki in Colombo in traditional Sri Lankan fashion on the 22nd of March. His younger brother, Fred Clark, and his Sri Lankan adoptive family were among the thousands in attendance. Topic: Science fiction writer. Topic. Beginnings While Clark had a few stories published in fanzines, between 1937 and 1945, his first professional sale appeared in Astounding Science Fiction in 1946. Loophole was published in April, while Rescue Party 
His first sale, was published in May. Along with his writing Clark briefly worked as assistant editor of Science Abstracts 1949 before devoting himself in 1951 to full-time writing. Clark began carving out his reputation as a scientific science fiction writer with his first science fiction novel, Against the Fall of Night, published as a novella in 1948. It was very popular and considered groundbreaking work for some of the concepts it contained. Clark revised and expanded the novella into a full novel which was published in 1953. Clark would later rewrite and expand this work a third time to become The City and the Stars in 1956, which rapidly became a definitive must-read in the field. His third science fiction novel, Childhood's End, was also published in 1953, cementing his popularity. Clark capped the first phase of his writing career with his sixth novel, A Fall of Moondust, in 1961, which is also an acknowledged classic of the period. During this time, Clark corresponded with C.S. Lewis in the 1940s and 1950s and they once met in an Oxford pub, The Eastgate, to discuss science fiction and space travel. Clark voiced great praise for Lewis upon his death, saying that the Ransom trilogy was one of the few works of science fiction that should be considered literature. Topic. The Sentinel In 1948 he wrote, The Sentinel, for a BBC competition. Though the story was rejected, it changed the course of Clark's career. Not only was it the basis for 2001, A Space Odyssey, but The Sentinel also introduced a more cosmic element to Clark's work. Many of Clark's later works feature a technologically advanced but still prejudiced mankind being confronted by a superior alien intelligence. In the cases of Childhood's End, and the 2001 series, this encounter produces a conceptual breakthrough that accelerates humanity into the next stage of its evolution. This also applies in the far distant past but our future in The City and the Stars and its original version, Against the Fall of Night. In Clark's authorized biography, Neil McAleer writes that Many readers and critics still consider Childhood's End Arthur C. Clarke's best novel. But Clarke did not use ESP in any of his later stories, saying, I've always been interested in ESP and, of course, Childhood's End was about that. But I've grown disillusioned, partly because after all this time they're still arguing about whether these things happen. I suspect that telepathy does happen." A collection of early essays was published in The View from Serendip, 1977, which also included one short piece of fiction, When the Twerms Came. Clark also wrote short stories under the pseudonyms of E. G. O'Brien and Charles Willis. Almost all of his short stories can be found in the book The Collected Stories of Arthur C. Clarke 2001. Topic. Big Three For much of the later 20th century, Clark, Asimov, and Heinlein were informally known as the Big Three of science fiction writers. Clark and Heinlein began writing to each other after The Exploration of Space was published in 1951, and first met in person the following year. They remained on cordial terms for many years, including visits in the United States and Sri Lanka. Clark and Asimov first met in New York City in 1953, and they traded friendly insults and gibs for decades. They established an oral agreement, the Clark-Asimov Treaty, that when asked who was better, the two would say Clark was the better science fiction writer and Asimov was the better science writer. In 1972, Clark put the treaty 
On paper in his dedication to report on Planet 3 and other speculations, in 1984, Clark testified before Congress against the Strategic Defense Initiative SDI. Later, at the home of Larry Niven in California, a concerned Heinlein attacked Clark's views on United States foreign and space policy especially the SDI, vigorously advocating a strong defense posture. Although the two later reconciled formally, they remained distant until Heinlein's death in 1988. Topic. 2001 series of novels 2001, A Space Odyssey, Clark's most famous work, was extended well beyond the 1968 movie as the Space Odyssey series. In 1982, Clark wrote a sequel to 2001 titled 2010, Odyssey 2, which was made into a film in 1984. Clark wrote two further sequels that have not been adapted into motion pictures, 2061, Odyssey 3, published in 1987, and 3001, The Final Odyssey, published in 1997. 2061, Odyssey 3 involves a visit to Halley's Comet on its next plunge through the inner solar system and a spaceship crash on the Jovian moon Europa. The whereabouts of astronaut Dave Bowman, the Star Child, the artificial intelligence HAL 9000, and the development of native life on Europa, protected by the alien monolith, are revealed. Finally, in 3001, the final Odyssey, astronaut Frank Poole's freeze dried body, found by a spaceship beyond the orbit of Neptune, is revived by advanced medical science. The novel details the threat posed to humanity by the alien monoliths, whose actions are not always as their builders had intended. Topic. 2001, A Space Odyssey Clark's first venture into film was 2001, A Space Odyssey, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick and Clark had met in New York City in 1964 to discuss the possibility of a collaborative film project. As the idea developed, they decided to loosely base the story on Clark's short story, The Sentinel, written in 1948 as an entry in a BBC short story competition. Originally, Clark was going to write the screenplay for the film, but Kubrick suggested during one of their brainstorming meetings that before beginning on the actual script, they should let their imaginations soar free by writing a novel first, on which they would base the film. This is more or less the way it worked out, though toward the end, novel and screenplay were being written simultaneously, with feedback in both directions. Thus I rewrote some sections after seeing the movie Rushes. A rather expensive method of literary creation, which few other authors can have enjoyed." The novel ended up being published a few months after the release of the movie. Due to the hectic schedule of the film's production, Kubrick and Clark had difficulty collaborating on the book. Clark completed a draft of the novel at the end of 1964 with the plan to publish in 1965 in advance of the film's release in 1966. After many delays the film was released in the spring of 1968, before the book was completed. The book was credited to Clark alone. Clark later complained that this had the effect of making the book into a novelization, that Kubrick had manipulated circumstances to downplay Clark's authorship. For these and other reasons, the details of the story differ slightly from the book to the movie. The film contains little explanation for the events taking place. Clark, on the other hand, wrote thorough explanations of cause and effect for the events in the novel. 
James Randi later recounted that upon seeing the premiere of 2001, Clark left the theater at the intermission in tears, after having watched an 11-minute scene which did not make it into general release where an astronaut is doing nothing more than jogging inside the spaceship, which was Kubrick's idea of showing the audience how boring space travels could be. In 1972, Clark published The Lost Worlds of 2001, which included his accounts of the production, and all alternative versions of key scenes. The special edition of the novel A Space Odyssey released in 1999 contains an introduction by Clark in which he documents the events leading to the release of the novel and film. Topic 2010 Odyssey 2 In 1982 Clark continued the 2001 epic with a sequel, 2010, Odyssey 2. This novel was also made into a film, 2010, directed by Peter Hyams for release in 1984. Because of the political environment in America in the 1980s, the film presents a Cold War theme, with the looming tensions of nuclear warfare not featured in the novel. The film was not considered to be as revolutionary or artistic as 2001, but the reviews were still positive. Clark's email correspondence with Hyams was published in 1984. Titled The Odyssey File, The Making of 2010, and co-authored with Hyams, it illustrates his fascination with the then-pioneering medium of email and its use for them to communicate on an almost daily basis at the time of planning and production of the film while living on opposite sides of the world. The book also included Clark's personal list of the best science fiction films ever made. Clark appeared in the film, first as the man feeding the pigeons while Dr. Haywood Floyd is engaged in a conversation in front of the White House. Later, in the hospital scene with David Bowman's mother, an image of the cover of Time portrays Clark as the American president and Kubrick as the Soviet premier. Topic. Rendezvous with Rama. Clark's award-winning novel Rendezvous with Rama 1973 was optioned for filmmaking in the early 21st century but this motion picture is in development hell as of 2014. In the early 2000s, the actor Morgan Freeman expressed his desire to produce a movie based on Rendezvous with Rama. After a drawn-out development process, which Freeman attributed to difficulties in getting financing, it appeared that in 2003 this project might be proceeding, but this is very dubious. The film was to be produced by Freeman's production company, Revelations Entertainment, and David Fincher has been touted on Revelations Rama web page as far back as 2001 as the film's director. After years of no progress, Fincher stated in an interview in late 2007, in which he also credited the novel as being influential on the films Alien and Star Trek, the motion picture, that he is still attached to Helm. Revelations indicated that Stel Pavlo had written the adaptation. In late 2008, Fincher stated the movie is unlikely to be made. It looks like it's not going to happen. There's no script and as you know, Morgan Freeman's not in the best of health right now. We've been trying to do it but it's probably not going to happen. However, in 2010 it was announced that the film was still planned for future production and both Freeman and Fincher mentioned it as still needing a worthy script. Topic. Science writer Clark published a number of nonfiction books with essays, speeches, addresses, etc. Several of his nonfiction books are composed of chapters that can stand on their own as separate essays. Topic. Space travel 
In particular, Clark was a popularizer of the concept of space travel. In 1950 he wrote Interplanetary Flight, a book outlining the basics of space flight for laymen. Later books about space travel included The Exploration of Space 1951, The Challenge of the Spaceship 1959, Voices from the Sky 1965, The Promise of Space 1968, Rev. Ed. 1970 and Report on Planet 3 1972, among others. Topic. Futurism His books on space travel usually included chapters about other aspects of science and technology, such as computers and bioengineering. He predicted telecommunication satellites albeit serviced by astronauts in space suits, who would replace the satellite's vacuum tubes as they burned out. His many predictions culminated in 1958 when he began a series of magazine essays that eventually became Profiles of the Future, published in book form in 1962. A timetable up to the year 2100 describes inventions and ideas including such things as a Global Library for 2005. The same work also contained Clark's First Law and text that became Clark's Three Laws in later editions. In a 1959 essay, Clark predicted global satellite TV broadcasts that would cross national boundaries indiscriminately and would bring hundreds of channels available anywhere in the world. He also envisioned a personal transceiver, so small and compact that every man carries one." He wrote, "...the time will come when we will be able to call a person anywhere on Earth merely by dialing a number." Such a device would also, in Clark's vision, include means for global positioning so that, "...no one need ever again be lost." Later, in Profiles of the Future, he predicted the advent of such a device taking place in the mid-1980s. In a 1974 interview with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the interviewer asked Clark how he believed the computer would change the future for the everyday person, and what life would be like in the year 2001. Clark accurately predicted many things that became reality, including online banking, online shopping, and other now commonplace things. Responding to a question about how the interviewer's son's life would be different, Clark responded, He will have, in his own house, not a computer as big as this, points to nearby computer, but at least, a console through which he can talk through his friendly local computer and get all the information he needs, for his everyday life, like his bank statements, his theater reservations, all the information you need in the course of living in our complex modern society, this will be in a compact form in his own house, and he will take it as much for granted as we take the telephone. An extensive selection of Clark's essays and book chapters from 1934 to 1998, 110 pieces, 63 of them previously uncollected in his books can be found in the book Greetings, Carbon-Based Bipeds, 2000, together with a new introduction and many prefatory notes. Another collection of essays, all previously collected, is by Space Possessed, 1993. Clark's technical papers, together with several essays and extensive autobiographical material, are collected in Ascent to Orbit, a scientific autobiography 1984. Topic. Geostationary Communications Satellite Clark contributed to the popularity of the idea that geostationary satellites would be ideal telecommunications relays. He first described this in a letter to the editor of Wireless World in February 1945 and elaborated on the concept in a paper titled Extraterrestrial Relays, Can Rocket Stations Give Worldwide Radio Coverage, published in Wireless World in October 1945. 
The geostationary orbit is now sometimes known as the Clark orbit or the Clark belt in his honor. It is not clear that this article was actually the inspiration for the modern telecommunications satellite. According to John R. Pierce, of Bell Labs, who was involved in the Echo Satellite and Telstar projects, he gave a talk upon the subject in 1954, published in 1955, using ideas that were in the air but was not aware of Clark's article at the time. In an interview given shortly before his death, Clark was asked whether he had ever suspected that one-day communications satellites would become so important. He replied, I'm often asked why I didn't try to patent the idea of a communications satellite. My answer is always, a patent is really a license to be sued. Though different from Clark's idea of telecom relay, the idea of communicating via satellites in geostationary orbit itself had been described earlier. For example, the concept of geostationary satellites was described in Hermann Oberth's 1923 book Die Rakete zu den Planetenroman, the rocket into interplanetary space, and then the idea of radio communication by means of those satellites in Hermann Potochnik's written under the pseudonym Hermann Nording 1928 book Das Problem der Befahrung des Weltraums, der Rocketen Motor, the problem of space travel, the rocket motor, sections, providing for long-distance communications and safety, and possibly referring to the idea of relaying messages via satellite, but not that three would be optimal, observing and researching the Earth's surface, published in Berlin. Clark acknowledged the earlier concept in his book Profiles of the Future. Topic. Undersea Explorer. Clark was an avid scuba diver and a member of the Underwater Explorers Club. In addition to writing, Clark set up several diving-related ventures with his business partner Mike Wilson. In 1956, while scuba diving, Wilson and Clark uncovered ruined masonry, architecture and idol images of the sunken original Kineswaram Temple, including carved columns with flower insignias, and stones in the form of elephant heads, spread on the shallow surrounding seabed. Other discoveries included Chola bronzes from the original shrine, and these discoveries were described in Clark's 1957 book The Reefs of Taprobane. In 1961, while filming off Great Bases Reef, Wilson found a wreck and retrieved silver coins. Plans to dive on the wreck the following year were stopped when Clark developed paralysis, ultimately diagnosed as polio. A year later, Clark observed the salvage from the shore and the surface. The ship, ultimately identified as belonging to the Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb, yielded fused bags of silver rupees, cannon, and other artifacts, carefully documented, became the basis for the treasure of the Great Reef. Living in Sri Lanka and learning its history also inspired the backdrop for his novel The Fountains of Paradise in which he described a space elevator. This, he believed, would make rocket-based access to space obsolete and, more than geostationary satellites, would ultimately be his scientific legacy. Topic. Views Topic. On religion Themes of religion and spirituality appear in much of Clark's writing. He said, Any path to knowledge is a path to God or reality, whichever word one prefers to use. He described himself as fascinated by the concept of God. J. B. S. Haldane, near the end of his life, suggested in a personal letter to Clark that Clark should receive a prize in theology for being one of the few people to write anything new on the subject, and went on to say that if Clark's writings did not contain multiple contradictory theological views, he might have been a menace. When he entered the Royal Air Force, Clark insisted that his dog tags be marked pantheist 
rather than the default, Church of England, and in a 1991 essay entitled, Credo, described himself as a logical positivist from the age of 10. In 2000, Clark told the Sri Lankan newspaper, The Island, I don't believe in God or an afterlife, and he identified himself as an atheist. He was honored as a humanist laureate in the International Academy of Humanism. He has also described himself as a crypto-Buddhist, insisting that Buddhism is not a religion. He displayed little interest about religion early in his life, for example, only discovering a few months after marrying that his wife had strong Presbyterian beliefs. A famous quotation of Clark's is often cited. One of the great tragedies of mankind is that morality has been hijacked by religion. He was quoted in Popular Science in 2004 as saying of religion, most malevolent and persistent of all mind viruses. We should get rid of it as quick as we can. In a three-day dialogue on man and his world, with Alan Watts, Clark stated that he was biased against religion and said that he could not forgive religions for what he perceived as their inability to prevent atrocities and wars over time. In his introduction to the penultimate episode of Mysterious World, entitled, Strange Skies, Clark said, I sometimes think that the universe is a machine designed for the perpetual astonishment of astronomers. Reflecting the dialogue of the episode, in which he stated this concept more broadly, referring to mankind. Near the very end of that same episode, the last segment of which covered the Star of Bethlehem, he said that his favorite theory was that it might be a pulsar. Given that pulsars were discovered in the interval between his writing the short story, The Star, 1955, and Making Mysterious World, 1980, and given the more recent discovery of Pulsar PSR B1913 plus 16, he said, How romantic, if even now, we can hear the dying voice of a star, which heralded the Christian era. Clark left written instructions for a funeral that stated, absolutely no religious rites of any kind, relating to any religious faith, should be associated with my funeral. Topic. Politics Regarding freedom of information Clark believed, in the struggle for freedom, of information, technology, not politics, will be the ultimate decider. Clark also wrote, It is not easy to see how the more extreme forms of nationalism can long survive when men have seen the earth in its true perspective as a single small globe against the stars. Regarding human jobs being replaced by robots Clark said, any teacher that can be replaced by a machine should be. Clark supported the use of renewable energy saying, I would like to see us kick our current addiction to oil, and adopt clean energy sources. Climate change has now added a new sense of urgency. Our civilization depends on energy, but we can't allow oil and coal to slowly bake our planet. Topic. Intelligent life Clark believed the best proof that there's intelligent life in outer space is the fact that it hasn't come here. The fact that we have not yet found the slightest evidence for life, much less intelligence, beyond this earth does not surprise or disappoint me in the least. Our technology must still be laughably primitive, we may well be like jungle savages listening for the throbbing of tom-toms, while the ether around them carries more words per second than they could utter in a lifetime. Clark also believed two possibilities exist, either we are alone in the universe or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. Topic. 
Paranormal phenomena Early in his career, Clark had a fascination with the paranormal and stated that it was part of the inspiration for his novel Childhood's End. Citing the numerous promising paranormal claims that were shown to be fraudulent, Clark described his earlier openness to the paranormal having turned to being an almost total skeptic by the time of his 1992 biography. During interviews, both in 1993 and 2004-2005, he stated that he did not believe in reincarnation, saying that there was no mechanism to make it possible, though he stated, I'm always paraphrasing J.B.S. Haldane, the universe is not only stranger than we imagine, it's stranger than we can imagine. He described the idea of reincarnation as fascinating, but favored a finite existence. Clark was well known for his television series investigating paranormal phenomena, Arthur C. Clark's Mysterious World, 1980, Arthur C. Clark's World of Strange Powers, 1985, and Arthur C. Clark's Mysterious Universe, 1994, enough to be parodied in an episode of The Goodies in which his show is cancelled after it is claimed that he does not exist. In Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World he gives three kinds of mysteries. Mysteries of the first kind. Something that was once utterly baffling, but is now completely understood. Clarke gives the example of a rainbow. Mysteries of the second kind. Something that is currently not fully understood and can be in the future. Mysteries of the third kind, something of which we have no understanding. Topic. Themes, style and influences Clark's work is marked by an optimistic view of science empowering mankind's exploration of the solar system and the world's oceans. His images of the future often feature a utopian setting with highly developed technology, ecology and society, based on the author's ideals. His early published stories usually featured the extrapolation of a technological innovation or scientific breakthrough into the underlying decadence of his own society. A recurring theme in Clark's works is the notion that the evolution of an intelligent species would eventually make them something close to gods. This was explored in his 1953 novel Childhood's End and briefly touched upon in his novel Imperial Earth. This idea of transcendence through evolution seems to have been influenced by Olaf Stapledon, who wrote a number of books dealing with this theme. Clark has said of Stapledon's 1930 book Last and First Men that, No other book had a greater influence on my life. It and its successor Star Maker 1937 are the twin summits of Stapledon's literary career. <laughs> Topic. Awards, honors and other recognition Clark won the 1963 Stuart Ballantine Medal from the Franklin Institute for the Concept of Satellite Communications, and other honors. He won more than a dozen annual literary awards for particular works of science fiction. In 1956, Clark won a Hugo Award for his short story, The Star. Clark won the UNESCO Kalinga Prize for the popularization of science in 1961. He won the Stuart Ballantine Medal in 1963. Shared a 1969 Academy Award nomination with Stanley Kubrick in the category Best Writing, Story and Screenplay, written directly for the screen for 2001, A Space Odyssey. The fame of 2001 was enough for the command module of the Apollo 13 craft to be named Odyssey. Clark won the Nebula 1973 for his novella, A Meeting with Medusa. Clark won both the Nebula 1973 and Hugo 1974 awards for his novel, Rendezvous with Rama. 
Clark won both the Nebula and Hugo awards for his novel, The Fountains of Paradise. In 1982, he won the Marconi Prize for Innovation in Communications and Remote Sensing in Space. In 1985 the Science Fiction Writers of America named him its seventh SFWA Grand Master. In 1986, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering for conception of geosynchronous communication satellites, and for other contributions to the use and understanding of space. In 1988, he was awarded an honorary degree Doctor of Letters by the University of Bath. Readers of the British Monthly Interzone voted him the all-time second best science fiction author in 1988-1989. He received a CBE in 1989, and was knighted in 2000. Clark's health did not allow him to travel to London to receive the latter honour personally from the Queen, so the United Kingdom's High Commissioner to Sri Lanka invested him as a Knight Bachelor at a ceremony in Colombo. In 1994, Clark was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize by La Professor Glenn Reynolds. The Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame inducted Clark in 1997, its second class of two deceased and two living persons. Among the living, Clark and Andre Norton followed A. E. Van Vogt and Jack Williamson. In 2000, he was named a Distinguished Supporter of the British Humanist Association. The 2001 Mars Odyssey Orbiter is named in honour of Clark's works. In 2003, Clark was awarded the Telluride Tech Festival Award of Technology, where he appeared on stage via a 3D hologram with a group of old friends that included Jill Tarter, Neil Armstrong, Louis Branscombe, Charles Towns, Freeman Dyson, Bruce Murray, and Scott Brown. In 2004, Clark won the Heinlein Award for Outstanding Achievement in Hard or Science-Oriented Science Fiction. On 14 November 2005 Sri Lanka awarded Clark its highest civilian award, the Sri Lankabhimanya, the pride of Sri Lanka, for his contributions to science and technology and his commitment to his adopted country. Clark was the honorary board chair of the Institute for Cooperation in Space, founded by Carol Rosen, and served on the Board of Governors of the National Space Society, a space advocacy organization founded by Werner von Braun. Topic. Named after Clark Topic. Awards Arthur C. Clarke Awards for Science Fiction Writing, awarded annually in the United Kingdom. In 1986, Clarke provided a grant to fund the prize money initially £1,000 for the Arthur C. Clarke Award for the Best Science Fiction Novel published in the United Kingdom in the previous year. In 2001 the prize was increased to £2,001, and its value now matches the year e.g., £2,005 in 2005. Sir Arthur Clarke Award, for Achievements in Space, awarded annually in the United Kingdom, in 2005 he lent his name to the inaugural Sir Arthur Clarke Awards, dubbed the Space Oscars. His brother attended the awards ceremony, and presented an award specially chosen by Arthur and not by the panel of judges who chose the other awards to the British Interplanetary Society. Arthur C. Clarke Foundation Awards, Arthur C. Clarke Innovators Award, and Arthur C. Clarke Lifetime Achievement Award. The Sir Arthur C. Clarke Memorial Trophy Interschool Astronomy Quiz Competition, held in Sri Lanka every year and organized by the Astronomical Association of Ananda College, Colombo. The competition first started in 2001 as the Sir Arthur C. Clarke Trophy Interschool Astronomy Quiz Competition, and was later renamed after his death. Arthur C. Clark Award for Imagination in Service to Society. 
Topic: Other. An asteroid was named in Clark's honor, 4923 Clark. The number was assigned prior to and independently of the name 2001. However, appropriate was unavailable, having previously been assigned to Albert Einstein. A species of Ceratopsian dinosaur, discovered in Inverloch in Australia, was named after Clark, Serendipiceratops Arthur Clarkey. The genus name may also be an allusion to his adopted country, Sri Lanka, one of whose former names is Serendip. The Learning Resource Centre at Richard Hewish College, Taunton, which Clark attended when it was Hewish Grammar School, is named after him. Clark was a distinguished vice president of the H. G. Wells Society, being strongly influenced by Wells as a science fiction writer. Arthur C. Clark Institute for Modern Technologies, one of the major research institutes in Sri Lanka is named after him. The main protagonist of the Dead Space series of video games, Isaac Clark, takes his surname from Arthur C. Clark, and his given name from Clark's friendly rival and associate, Isaac Asimov. A proposed outer circular orbital beltway in Colombo, Sri Lanka, is to be named Arthur C. Clark Expressway in honor of Clark. The Clark event is a proposed name for GRB 080319b, a gamma-ray burst detected just hours before Clark's death that set a new record for the most intrinsically bright object ever observed by humans in the universe. The name would honor Clark and his award-winning short story, The Star. Clark Montez, a mountain on Pluto's moon Charon is named after Clark. Topic. Selected works Topic. Novels Against the Fall of Night 1948, 1953, original version of The City and the Stars Prelude to Space 1951. The Sands of Mars 1951. Islands in the Sky 1952 Childhood's End 1953 Earthlight 1955 The City and the Stars 1956 The Deep Range 1957 A Fall of Moondust 1961 Dolphin Island A Story of the People of the Sea 1963 Glide Path 1963 2001 A Space Odyssey 1968 film with Stanley Kubrick Rendezvous with Rama 1973 Imperial Earth 1976 The Fountains of Paradise 1979 2010 Odyssey 2 1982 The Songs of Distant Earth 1986 2061, Odyssey 3, 1987. The Ghost from the Grand Banks, 1990. The Hammer of God, 1993. 3001, The Final Odyssey, 1997. Topic: Short Story Collections. Expedition to Earth 1953 Reach for Tomorrow 1956 Tales from the White Heart 1957 The Other Side of the Sky 1958 Tales of 10 Worlds 1962 The 9 Billion Names of God 1967 Of Time and Stars 1972 the Wind from the Sunday, 1972. The Best of Arthur C. Clarke, 1973. The Sentinel, 1983. Tales from Planet Earth, 1990. The Collected Stories of Arthur C. Clarke, 2001. 
Topic Nonfiction Interplanetary Flight, An Introduction to Astronautics 1950, London, Temple Press, ISBN 0-425-06448-4 The Exploration of Space 1951, New York, Harper and Brothers The Exploration of the Moon 1954, with R. A. Smith, New York, Harper Brothers The Coast of Coral 1955, London, Frederick Muller Boy Beneath the Sea 1958, New York Harper, ISBN 0060212667 Voice Across the Sea 1958, New York, Harper Profiles of the Future, An Inquiry into the Limits of the Possible 1962, New York, Harper and Row The Treasure of the Great Reef 1964, with Mike Wilson, New York, Harper and Row Voices from the Sky, Previews of the Coming Space Age 1965, New York, Harper and Row The Promise of Space 1968, New York, Harper and Row The View from Serendip, 1977, New York, Random House, ISBN 0-394-41796-8-1984-1 Spring, A Choice of Futures, 1984, Collected Nonfiction Writings, New York, Del Rey, Ballantyne, ISBN 0-345-31357-7 Astounding Days, A Science Fictional Autobiography, 1989, London, Gollants, ISBN 0-575-04446-2 How the World Was Won, Beyond the Global Village, 1992, London, Gollants, ISBN 0-575-05226-0 Greetings, Carbon-Based Bipeds, Collected Essays, 1934-1998, 1999, New York, Street. Martin's Press, and London, Voyager. Topic. Documentaries To Mars by a Bomb, The Secret History of Project Orion 2003. Topic. See also Arthur C. Clark Portal equals equals notes